So uh, my name is Thomas Poikert. I am a consultant neurologist in Belfast, and my special interest is headache and also acute neurology, where I see patients coming into the ED department with any neurological symptoms, but half of them will be actually headache. So headache is very, very common in, in ED, and I see them at an early stage. And we have a headache clinic in Belfast where I work together with two physiotherapists and I have two nurses working with me and also one psychologist. So we have a quite, well, a big enough team. We would need more consultants, but uh, actually our team is actually quite, quite good. And especially psychology support is important in migraine. Um, so I'm proud that we have this available. So thank you for inviting me. And when I was asked by the Migraine Trust to talk about migraine in men, I, it was the first time I said I have to think about it because I have never been on a presentation of migraine in men, and I really had to read things up about it uh, because it is not really very well reported. There's a lot about migraine in women, a lot about the hormone change, but I was really unclear what I'm going to talk about it. So I, I asked the Migraine Trust to give me a week to think about it, so I'm really grateful if you have any comments, anything you missed in the talk, anything I should talk about, just email me. There's my email address on the slide uh, and make suggestions because it's the first time I talk about it. And this would be a perfect talk to have it face to face because I would like to learn from you in the same way you can learn from me. But I have to learn a lot of things because I don't have migraine. I'm a man. I don't have migraine. And a lot of things I'm presenting today is based on my experience, really. So... Just oh, cannot move the slides. One second. And... No. If you just press enter, does it does it move it along, Thomas? Oh, here this button. Okay, that's fine. Okay, so that's the agenda. It's very short. I talk a bit about background, then I talk about stigma, and then I talk about medications in general, but especially special consideration for men because you have to think about do men need different medications than women. But the first question is really, do men have migraine or is migraine a female disease? Uh, now, that is the first question. And I have a few examples of patients who are male and have migraine. Now, this, for example, you know him, Simon Cowell. He is um, obviously X Factor, uh, one of the judges. And he missed, I think, three auditions from X Factor. And you have to think now about him. He, is, he has migraine. He has to ring in at about 3 o'clock in the afternoon tell the channel, I am not showing up tonight at 8 o'clock on a live show where thousands of people are waiting, everything is organized, and he has to ring in and say, sorry, I can't come because I have a headache. And I know there's a lot of stigma around migraine. When you are sick, you have to ring your employer. A lot of men struggle with this. And I mentioned this guy who has to ring in saying, sorry, I won't come tonight, I have a headache. Now, he was able to identify his trigger. He noticed that... Uh, that when he is in the studio, the light was triggering him. him. So he found the solution. That was the solution, 20 pound Googles from Amazon, and they worked for him. But everyone will have different triggers. Now, say this example for two reasons. Number one, the stigma of men ringing in sick at work is big. And number two is always think about triggers. Is light annoying you, loud noises, stress. So I always tell patients when you have a bad headache day, Think back, what did you do 24 hours before? What did you eat? Any stressful situation? How did you sleep? Did you exercise or not? Always think back 24 hours before to try to identify trigger. And that sometimes helps. Another patient, you won't know him maybe, Lewis Carroll. He is a British writer and he has migraine. And he has a special kind of migraine. He has a migraine which was associated, we call it micropsia or macropsia, which means before he got the headache, he had the impression he is shrinking. He got smaller, 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 and his environment was getting bigger, bigger, bigger. So when he was in his bed, he got tiny, the bed got huge, the dog got huge, his dog got huge, um, or other times it was the other round. He got, um, he got huge and everything around him got smaller. That is kind of aura. And he wrote a book about this, and this book is called Alice in Wonderland. So he's the writer of Alice in Wonderland, and Alice in Wonderland is based on his migraine experience. Um, and when you now Google Alice in Wonderland syndrome, it will come up, this will come up, 
as one of the possible auras for migraine, but also for other neurological conditions where patients have the feeling everything around them gets bigger or smaller. Another man, Terrell Davis. He is a American football player and he has migraines since seven years old and he has exercise-induced migraine. Now, exercise-induced migraine is more common in men than in women. And although men and women job-wise getting closer together, we do know that still labor work is more common in men. And for that reason, labor work can be a trigger quite often for migraine. So he had exercise-induced migraine and was a professional American football player. And the way he managed this was that he always took a preventer, like a triptan, before a match. But in 1998, he was playing with his team, the Denver Broncos, uh, in, in the Super Bowl. And he forgot to take his medications. And he needed to be taken off the pitch with a migraine. Now, again, imagine this big guy in the Super Bowl has to tell his coach, sorry, I got a migraine. I can't continue to play. How, how this affects him? So he went off the pitch, took his preventer, came back on the pitch because the headache settles. He did three touch uh, he did three touchdowns and was voted the most valuable player of the match. And he won the Super Bowl and the MVP award. So he was able to manage this. He found a way to manage it. I give you this example because exercise induced migraine, again, big in men, and also um the stigma saying as a rugby player, or not rugby, as an American football player, that you have to be off the pitch with migraine. And he is now, he said he kept it secret for years and years and years. And now he's an advocate about migraine and men. Elvis Presley, he has migraine. I give you this example because when he has migraine, it was a different time. The typical medications now like Botox and monoclonal antibodies, they all were not available. So he used old fashioned medications. And we do know when I talk later about it more, Medications in migraine quite often can affect the heart. And he was obviously young when he had a heart attack. And his physician was later interviewed after his death and it became obvious that he possibly got the heart attack secondary due to some of his migraine medications he took. So that is something you have to think about, men, medications affecting the heart. So uh, he might have died as a side effect, we don't know for sure, secondary due to medication he took for migraine. That's him after a concert where he has a migraine. And the most famous man, you probably think, why didn't I talk early on about him, with migraine, is this man, Homer Simpson. Now, Homer Simpson has migraine. And uh, he was, he has migraine for a long time, actually. And he thought back, well, where is the headache coming from? And then he thought back and realized, well, actually, when I was younger, I had a head trauma. And he remembered when he was seven years old, he uh, shifted a crayon up his nose and he told us his GP and he got an MRI scan done and you can still see the crayon stacking in the front loop. So he was able to identify a trigger, crayon was removed and Homer Simpson's migraine free. So think about triggers. And again, head injury are more common in men. But we do know that head injury are two to three times more common in men than women. You can get a migraine after head injury. You can get chronic migraine. So some patients have episodic migraine before, have a head injury, and that convert the episodic into chronic migraine. We do know that men more often go to ED and to the GP post head injury. So the question was, do men have migraine? The answer is yes. There's no doubt about it. Now, how common are migraine in men? Now, we know that about 20% of female patients have migraine and about 10% of male patients have migraine. Now you think, well, female double as often, but 10% of men is actually quite a lot. And when you look at the numbers, really, when you look at numbers, how many patients in the UK have diabetes, male and females, it is similar. So the same numbers of male with migraine than male and females having diabetes. So it's not a rare condition. It's common enough. Typically 20 to 50 years old, um, but quite often female, quite often related to hormone change, men quite often not. So I thought in my clinic, I don't have a third of patients being male. So I looked as I prepared for this talk to my Botox list. And what this showed, I don't know if you can see that there really, 
um, because of the or picture on the side. Now, in my Botox, I have only 14% male patient and 86% are female. And I thought, well, why is that? Do I maybe offer more Botox to female patients and it neglect the men? So I looked through my list for monoclonal antibodies. Same thing, only 16% were male. And then I looked at the referrals I got from GPs. I want to know, are GPs maybe not referring men to me? Do they maybe refer more women? And actually, is right. They only referred 17% of men. So the question is, I don't know why this is. Is it because GPs don't think, don't refer the men? Or is it because male patients don't go to their GP? It is most commonly the reason. I suppose that's the reason that men don't present to their GP. But you can see in headache clinics, I mean, look at papers, that seems to be not unique. That seems to be in general, men are not getting as often seen in secondary tertiary care. They don't get the same treatment offered than women. Now, this is completely different to this here, to pain bias men, women. When you look how men and women are being treated in health services, we do know that women are getting in general disadvantaged. We do know that women are getting quite often not treated as aggressive as men. We do know that women quite often got the label oh, it's of stress or you are hysterical or something like this. We do know that women get less MRI scan and less CT scan done. We know that women don't get quite often referred to secondary tertiary care. We do know in general, men are treating, getting treated better than women in the health service. And this doesn't really go ahead with what I just told you, because why do I have so many patients who are female on Botox when women are getting better treatment? We also know that women uh, go about 30% more often to their GP. And there's the question, what is the problem? Is a woman go too often to the GP or does men not go often enough to their GP? Um, so in migraine, we really know, we think, that is really, there's a stigma about migraine. So then I suppose most of you are many in the talk. When one of you have a broken ankle, it is obvious. You go to your GP, you are not embarrassed about it. But when you have a headache, it's felt that men quite often think, well, there's something in my head. You don't have an abnormal MRI. You don't have an abnormal X-ray. You don't have abnormal blood results. So these are kind of conditions where men are not very good in presenting themselves to the GP. And they think it's just a headache. It's a woman's disease. You might think about your job. You maybe don't want to tell your boss, I have a headache. It might affect your career. You don't know. You have to soldier on culture, be tough. Um, and uh, some men might be embarrassed of having a headache and don't tell people. I don't know. You are all here now. You are possibly dealing with your headache. You accept it and you're working on it. This is good. But there are a lot of men around who don't tell anyone. About 15% of men with headache don't tell anyone, not even her wife, his wife, that they have a headache. Um, and that is it's a problem. So this is a slide, I don't have headache, where you can email these things and say what else there is, because you know more about these things than I do. Uh, and I'm just really guided on my experience and what I'm reading up. But it would be really useful to talk with you and hear what you think. Why do you think men don't ask for medical advice? How do you feel at work? And all these kind of things that would be really useful for me to know, especially when you give more presentations about it. Here's some quotes from headache experts. The migraine is still so deeply embedded in our cultural psyche as weakness, failure, and an inability to cope. So there's in many cultures, you know, migraine is kind of a weakness. Man has to be strong. Man has to be tough. Uh, man has to you know, soldier on. So this is quite often in many cultures like this. But when you look in, for example, the middle one, we do know that 30% veterans coming back from Iraq have migraine, complain about headache. Now they are coming back and they say they have a headache, but then other people come back with gunshot wounds, with amputated legs, with having lost an eye or whatever it is, and they say, I have a headache. Again, men possibly feel that having a headache is minor compared to losing a leg. Now you cannot compare diseases. Well, the whole World Health Organization tried to do it at one stage, but it's really tricky to do that. But it can be embarrassing maybe for a soldier to say, when I come back, I have a headache. You know, they might be glad they're still alive. Uh, so it's it's very really tricky for men sometimes. Why do get more uh, women 
uh, headaches in men. The main thing is hormones. We know that uh, by far the biggest thing. But it's not all about hormones. It's also about people, different people feel pain differently. Um, there might be different structures. Brain structure of male and female are different. Genetic factors, behavior problems. As, as I told you earlier, for example, work. When you're working with labor work, you might lift a lot. Uh, heavy lifting can trigger migraine. When a woman, for example, works more often as a hairdresser, maybe the spray triggers a migraine. The different jobs, different environment can cause a migraine. Nutrition, we do know possibly female eat healthier than men. And hormonal, I told you earlier on, the so hormones it is mostly due to a fluctuation of the estrogen level. It's a female hormone, and this drops down like a day before your period. And quite often, that's the time when a woman is getting the headache. Uh, then menopausal headache is a big problem. Now, men don't have this fluctuation of hormones. And I'm always getting asked, can testosterone cause migraine as well? No, they don't think so. But what they do know is then when you have a female patient who has migraine and the female patients wants to change the sex to male, wants to change the, the sex to male and starts to take testosterone that the headache is getting better. That suggests that maybe testosterone is preventing it for headache. I don't know. Um, but uh, hormones are obviously a big trigger. And there's a difference that double as many women getting, getting migraines than men, but the number of men are still huge. Now, there's a question. Who has the worst migraine? Is the migraine on a woman worth or the migraine on a man worth? Does it make it different? And it probably depends whom you're asking. I don't know how many of you have a wife who has migraine as well. And maybe you talk about it and you say, oh, my migraine is worse. You just have a headache. I have a migraine. So I don't know. Um, but this is a study done by a female researcher in uh, 2022. And they came to the conclusion that woman has longer attacks. Woman has a higher recurrence of, uh, of uh, risk of recurrence. Women are more disabled and they need a longer time to recover. That sounds woman's migraine is worse. On the other hand, the migraine trust has sent a, a survey out, and I actually can't see all the data there, but it looks like they ask male and female and male, um, how does migraine affect your ability to exercise? How does it affect your mental health, general health, work life, social life, family life, and relationship? And when you, the, the data will show you that when you ask all of them, the numbers are something between 20 and 30%. When you look only at the male, they are 70 70, 80 percent, so much, much higher. So this survey suggests that men are much more affected by migraine. So I don't make any comments about it. Uh, I just leave it up to you. There are different studies and how do you examine. It doesn't matter. Men get migraine, women get migraine. It seems that the migraine is slightly different. It doesn't matter what migraine is really worse. But we do know that the male and the female brain, uh, the male brain and the female brain are different. We do know that um, the good news is that male brain is 10% bigger, uh, but the bad news is don't get too excited about it because uh, it doesn't mean anything because the female brain has more gray matter. So uh, that doesn't mean male or female are more intelligent or better or worse, yeah, but they are a bit different. So we do, for example, know that men are better maybe in motor skills. Women are maybe better in intuitive thinking. Uh, there's different kind of connection in the brain. So the man has more a stronger front to back connection, while the woman has more a side to side connection that maybe affects the brain. And we also know that brains are different because some brain disorders are more common in men and some more in women, which can't be explained by hormones. For example, women get more often multiple sclerosis. So why is that? Why does men not getting the same number of multiple sclerosis? On the other hand, men are getting more Parkinson's disease. So you know that there are neurological conditions more common in men, more common in female. Nobody knows why it is. So there must be some kind of difference while people are getting it. We do know that men have more, more likely problems with alcohol dependence and all kinds of dependences than women. We know, know that more, men have more likely autism than women while well, women have more likely depression and Alzheimer's disease. Uh, so male and female brain are different, and there's no doubt that the migraine is different, uh, but for different reasons, um, men and women are getting affected in a different way from the migraine.
Now, <clears throat> this is a migraine talk, but there are hundreds of headache disorder. Migraine is one of them, different type of migraine. Uh, but there are other headache disorders. When you look at the example for tension headache, tension headache is the most common headache. Tension headache is much more a milder headache. It's a milder headache, which normally goes away with paracetamol or brufen. It's more like a headache, like a bend around the head. It's more mild. And usually, although tension headache is the most common headache, tension headache patients wouldn't really go to the ED department or to the GP because we all have sometimes a bit of tension headache. Tension headache is not related to getting worse with light or loud noises or smell or not getting worse with exercise. The mild pain we all get from time to time. Then you have the cluster headache. And the cluster headache is typically more often in males than in female. Now, here is written down 6 to 1. New studies showed that possibly is more closer two or three times to one. That there's not as a big difference between male and female. And they think that maybe a lot of female patients, when you go with a headache as a woman to your GP, the GP already has in the back of the head, oh, it's a female headache like a migraine. And when a man goes to ED, they might think, oh, it's more male headache like a cluster headache. So it might be that woman getting underdiagnosed with cluster headache. Now, to one of you, who don't know if they have a cluster headache. A cluster headache is a headache that's extremely severe. It's 10 out of 10. It's always on one side of the head. It's never on both sides, on one side of the head. And you have something called autonomic features, which means you have a runny eye or a red eye with a headache. And a cluster headache is never longer than three hours. A migraine is normally longer without medication. The cluster headache is always between 15 minutes and three hours. And cluster headache patients are, are restless. They don't go to bed and they lie down in a dark, quiet room. They are wandering around the house. They bang their head on the wall. They're distressed with a headache. Now, a lot of cluster headache patients go to their GP while they don't have the headache and getting the diagnosis as having a migraine. And I saw a lot of patients in the migraine or headache clinic who were misdiagnosed for 10, 15, 20 years of migraine, but having actually cluster headache. So think about, is your headache in keeping with severe headache on one side of the head, autonomic features, runny eye, red eyes, being distressed, waking up at night with a headache, that is typically for a cluster headache. And there's a website called, called Ouch UK. And when you go there, Ouch UK, that is a, a, that is a website for cluster headache patients. You can read up and you can, I think you can do a self-assessment to see what the diagnosis is. Um, and then you have medication overuse headache. And again, that is more often female than male in general. Um, and that is also I will talk in a second about. So make sure the diagnosis is correct you're having, because on one hand, I told you male quite often don't get diagnosed, but if you are getting diagnosed, you have to make sure you're getting the right diagnosis. Now, medications. Now, there are different kinds of medications. So you can take acute medications or you can take preventers. You can take acute medications when you, for example, getting a headache and you just want to take something and half an hour later, you want to be pain-free. The preventers are different. The preventers are a tablet you take every day, and you have to take them every day for at least six to eight weeks before they start to work. So they don't work straight away. They are more slow-acting. And uh, the preventers, none of the preventers, the common preventers in tablet form, was actually in invented to treat migraine. They were all invented to treat something else. So the risk that we quite often having is that patients take too many acute medication. If you take too many acute medications, you run the risk of developing a medication overuse headache. And because men do not go to their GP, what they do is they go to, they fill up the petrol on the petrol station and then go in and grab a bag of another extra and take that. And that is not the right thing to do because uh, you need to control your medication. Now you can buy here in America, you can buy these tablets over the counter. Where I'm from, in Germany, you cannot do that. You have to go to pharmacy to buy these medications, and they will ask you questions. And the risk is that people think, oh, because I can buy them over the counter, they don't do harm. And that's the problem. So let's talk about the simple the acute medications. Yes, the simple painkillers, like paracetamol, brufen, naproxen, Voltor, and aspirin. Yes, yeah, simple painkillers, we call them. Then the anti-sickness tablets, metoclopramide, peridone. Clarazine, and then you have triptans. There are seven different triptans, and they all have advantages and disadvantages. Triptans were the only tablet out of these who were invented to treat migraine. 
And when you look how many out of these you can buy over the counter, the yellow one are the one you can buy over the counter. You can go and buy them without actually going to your GP. Um, and you might think, well, they're pretty safe. You can buy them over the counter. It's straight between the sweets, uh, but they can give you side effects as well. For example, paracetamol. Paracetamol can give you liver failure. We do know that males have a higher risk of getting liver failure. And I give you one example. I have a, a lady who was in her 20s with toothache and took too many paracetamol and she ended up with a liver transplant. So don't think because you can buy it over the counter, it is doing no harm. If you take paracetamol more often than 20 days per month, you will get a medication over your headache. Then you have to take a preventer, something every day instead. Brufen, non steroidal brufen, you get kidney failure if you take them too often. And again, we know male patients have more often kidney failure than female patients. So I do not know how many of you know what your kidney function is doing. Um, so that is something when you take these medications regular, you should go to your doctor and maybe somebody has to look into your kidney. Baseline kidney function may repeat it from time to time. And for example, I give you an example. I have two dogs. When I go with my dogs to the vet who are getting these kind of drugs, I have to bring them in every three months to get a real a kidney, uh, a kidney blood taken. Um, but humans can buy it over the counter. So it's kind of kind of wrong. Aspirin give you stomach ulcers. Again, we know male patients have a higher risk of getting stomach ulcers if you take too much aspirin. If you take aspirin again more often, 15 days per month, it gives you stomach ulcers. Cocodamol, cocodamol was not on this first list here. I put it on because cocodamol is not really a drug for migraine. Let's read this in red. But a lot of patients take it for migraine. But cocodamol, I would never prescribe for migraine because the codeine makes you addicted. And that is a huge problem. So if you get cocodamol more than eight days per month or longer than three months, you get a codeine induced headache. So, so it's a codeine, that is a codeine addiction. Big problem in America. Uh, but all over the world, really. And the triptans, I told you early on, the triptans were invented to treat migraine. When the triptans were invented, I think it was maybe in the 70s or so, it was thought that migraine was brought on by vasodilatation, which means it was brought on by dilated blood vessels. So they decided to invent a drug that constricts blood vessels, makes them tight. So they invented the triptans. What they didn't know at that stage was that while you have the aura before the migraine, you get vasoconstriction, you're getting tight blood vessels. For that reason, triptans, when you have migraine with aura, can make your blood vessels more tight and can give you conditions like a stroke or a heart attack. For that reason, triptans are absolutely contraindicated in someone who has a stroke or a heart attack in the past. But you can buy them over the counter. Uh, it's too much triptan, which is quite concerning, really. Because I know of patients who has, I know patients who have myocardial infarction after using triptan. So these drugs should be really recommended by the GP. If you take them more often than eight days per month, again, they can give you a headache. They're very good drugs for the right kind of people. If you do have migraine with aura, if you, for example, get first visual disturbances followed by a headache, you should take the triptan after the visual disturbances before the headache comes on. Otherwise, you're running the risk of getting a stroke or a heart attack. So heart attack and stroke are the side effects there. So you can see even the tablets you buy over the counter can give you side effect. Don't take it for granted. And you can see the problem here. These are all articles all over the world. It's a big thing in America, a huge problem in San Francisco with drugs you can buy over the counter. When you go with this guy in the corner, the top left, one guy was taking 48 tablets a day in his hand, he had a brufen. And he has no holes burnt in the stomach. <laughs> Always very dramatic, but uh, you know, codeine can give you addiction all over. There's an Australian article. So it's not only UK, it's all over the world. There's this problem with medication you buy over the counter. And men run this problem because men with migraine do not want to go to the GP and trying to manage it themselves. And you run the risk of, of if you do it too often, to end up with medication over your headache or with getting side effect like Elvis Presley from the headaches. Now let's talk about the migraine preventers. The preventer, the tablet, you take every day to prevent you from getting a headache. And you have to take them for six to eight weeks. 
before you know they work or they don't work. If a migraine preventer doesn't work after six to eight weeks, you should stop it. Quite often we see patients who take amitriptyline for five years and we ask them, does it help the headaches? They say, no. Why do you take them? Well, I don't know. My GP gave it to me. So take it six to eight weeks. If after six to eight weeks there's no benefit, stop it and try the next one. If they do work, I tell patients to keep going for six to 12 months and then slowly try to wean yourself off because uh, you don't want to take a tablet for the rest of your life that maybe doesn't do after a while. Or maybe the migraine is treated or cured. You don't have maybe migraine. They try to wean yourself off gradually. You can always pop it up again if you need it, but you don't want to take a tablet for the rest of your life that you maybe don't need and with all the side effects. Now, there are a huge number of migraine preventers. I just talk about the big four ones. So you have propanolol. I told you early on, none of the preventers was invented to treat migraine. So propanolol is a beta blocker, was invented to treat high blood pressure. And the dose normally is 40 milligrams. The packet that's at 10 milligrams. That's more for panic attacks, really. But so normally 40 milligrams. And you give it twice a day, and you can increase up to 120 milligrams twice a day. And then you should keep going on the 120 milligrams for six to eight weeks. If the patient said, oh, I'm getting too dizzy, or the blood pressure is getting too low on 125 milligrams twice a day, you continue maybe on 80 milligrams for six to eight weeks. So the highest tolerated dose, six to eight weeks. If it doesn't work, you stop it. You can't take it when you have asthma or COPD and also low blood pressure, low heart rate. And it's reduced an average your headache days by 50%. Now, what's the difference with men? In men, and this problem with a lot of these preventers, can give you erectile and sexual dysfunction. And thus be aware of this. I don't think the GP will explain this to you, but it is a common side effect on propanolol. It can reduce the sperm count. Diabetes is higher in men, so it can affect with your blood sugars. And because it's a heart tablet, if you have heart problems, you need to be aware of this. And we do know middle-aged men, much higher risk of having heart problems than middle-aged women. After menopause, female and male, not a big difference. But before the menopause, men have a much higher risk of getting heart problems. So for that reason, a lot of these drugs we are giving for migraine actually hard tablets, and you need to be aware of this. Amitriptyline, the second one, was designed to treat depression. So we don't really give it for depression anymore, but we do know that a lot of migraine patients do have depression from the headache and the side effects, secondary depression. So sometimes for these patients, it's useful to give it because it might improve the mood a bit as well. The dose you can sell on 10 milligrams, some consult and sell on five, some on 25 milligrams, different regimes. Highest dose is 150 milligrams for migraine. You take it normally at night because it can make it tired and sleepy. And what we normally tell patients is that when you are getting up, for example, at seven o'clock in the evening, take it, take it at seven o'clock. Sorry, when you're getting up at seven o'clock in the morning, take it at seven o'clock in the evening, like 12 hours before the first time. Then you can play a bit around because most people make the mistake to take it too late in the evening, like midnight, getting up at six and then they're tired. So make sure you have 12 hours between time. Again, it can affect the heart. It can affect your, well, the ECG, QT interval. And uh, and for that reason, you again need to be careful with irregular heartbeats. So especially when you're on other antidepressant that also can affect your heartbeat and then you add amitriptyline for migraine, you need regular ECG. So amitriptyline, you normally need a regular ECG to make sure that the heart is fine. Candesatin, the third one, is probably the, the, the newest one out of these four. Uh, they used it a lot in Scandinavia and America before it came to the UK. It's also a blood pressure tablet, similar to propanolol. The advantage of candesatin is that candesatin doesn't drop so much down the blood pressure when the blood pressure is low. So in other words, when you have a blood pressure of 100 over 60, so a low blood pressure, and take propanolol, most likely the blood pressure will be too low and won't be tolerated. Candesatin doesn't reduce the blood pressure on these patients so much, so it's a bit more safe. And it's a dose of 2 milligrams twice a day, you go up to 16 milligrams over the day, and again, low blood pressure, uh, and similar, similar benefits than propanolol. And I don't think there's any major conservation for men. I don't think it's increased the risk of heart attack. I'm not sure. I don't think it is doing anything about sexual dysfunction or something like this. So that's been pretty, pretty safe in men. And the last out of the four one is topiramate. Topiramate is an anti-epileptic drug, was designed for epilepsy. 
and the dose is 25 milligrams, go up to 100 milligrams twice, side effects can make your mood worse. When you're prone to depression, it can make it tearful. It actually the best migraine tablets by looking at the numbers, how it improves the headache, but it's one of the worst in being tolerated because patients get side effects quite often. Can you pins and needles? Um, you can't take it in pregnancy. That doesn't account for you, but uh, I talk something in a second about this. And uh, again, consider erectile dysfunction. Now, the last two drugs, to pyramate and candesartan, we do know we would not give to female patients who want to get pregnant because it can affect the fetus. Now, on male, there is no study done if these two drugs would affect it when you are trying to father a child at the time. But there are other drugs. There is something called sodium valproate. I don't know if you ever heard of sodium valproate, called also epilim. It's an anti-epileptic drug. In the past, it was also given for migraine. And there was no found out that it's really poor on women who are getting pregnant. So it's a big, it's a big lot of news about it. But they also think now that this maybe also affected the men who fathered the child during the time. So although candesartan and topiramate, I have no evidence, there's no papers done at the moment that they that you shouldn't father a child. It might be in 20 years, they say, well, it wasn't a good idea. So I Top, I, I talk with male patients about this. I tell them, look, I don't know at the moment, no evidence, but I would be careful if you really plan a family at the moment, maybe think about something else. Okay. So if you have failed on three migraine preventers, three of these or any other ones, you would qualify for father treatment or secondary treatment, for example, Botox. Now, I told you early on, men do not like to go to the GP because they think it's a sign of weakness. They definitely don't like to go to the GP saying, oh, I have a headache. And they definitely don't like to go to the GP and want to get Botox for the headache. So uh, this is possibly something that may feel a bit funny about. Now, Botox, we give in neurology for a long, long time. Botox, in general, everybody thinks about wrinkle treatment, cosmetic Botox. That's only 50% of the treatment. The other 50% are medical treatments. So we give it for dystonia. We give it for MS patients who can't straighten the legs. We give it for paralyzed patients. So for and the, the history of Botox is actually interesting. So we gave it for a patient who has, it's called blepharospasm. There's, no, there's nervous eye blinking. So we injected Botox around the eyes to relax these muscles. And these patients then reported that the wrinkle got better. Then the cosmetic industry jumped in and they took it all over. And these patients who got then Botox for cosmetic reasons, were quite often female, young, realized, oh, my headache is getting better. Then they did a trial called the preempt trial for Botox and migraine. And obviously we give it now for Botox and migraine. And these patients are reporting that their depression is getting better. So the question is, is the depression getting better because the headache is getting better? Or is it anyway getting better? And my understanding is that at the moment there's a trial to look at patients who are depressed without a headache if Botox helps for depression. So it goes from one to the next. In general, Botox, as I told you, we have quite a lot of patients uh, in the Belfast Trust on Botox, but mostly women, because men, for whatever reason, well, don't get referred to me, and maybe they don't want it. Uh, they might be embarrassed to get Botox. So, uh, this is the question I would like to ask you, actually. It would be better to have it face-to-face -face because I wonder how you would feel. Would you tell your colleagues I'm getting Botox for migraine? I'm not sure. Um, so we have a few of them. We do know it works slightly better for women than for men, I have to say, Botox, but there's not a lot of evidence, but there's a feeling it might work slightly better for female patients than for male patients. And then there are the other drugs. These are the monoclonal antibodies. These are the newest drugs, um, kind of. Um, these are injections. Either you inject yourself at home every four weeks, or there is a drip as well. You can get every 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 four, every few weeks as an infusion. So a different kind of monoclonal antibodies. They are new. We don't have too many on this, but it's getting more and more and more. And again, mostly patients are female on it. When you look at the studies, it seems in the studies men were underrepresented. So they, there was no difference between male and female response to this but the number of male patients in these studies was, was not as big. So I'm not sure how you know, reliable this is. So some people suggest you have to do a study really on men to look how good this drug treatment is on male patients. These are the treatments and they're slightly different on men and women, just think about it. 
And this will be a take home message. Uh, so number one is a huge number of patients migraine. Don't think, oh, because it's two to one or people have migraine. Migraine is as common in men than diabetes overall. So it's huge, 10% is huge. It's a big disease. It's quite often young people, either people that are working, patients that are working. So it's really expensive for the, well, not only for the NHS, it's expensive for, for the society migraine. Um, quite often, men don't get the accurate diagnosis. There are two reasons for this. Number one is men do not go to their doctor. They diagnose themselves as a headache, which is not a diagnosis, because they have a headache. Or GPs maybe don't think themselves that maybe a man could have a migraine and give them a different diagnosis, or I don't know. But men are quite often getting this misdiagnosed. Men have a higher risk of getting a heart attack when they have migraine, about 50% higher than, than women has to do, they have anyway a higher risk, but then some of the medication increase their risk, and some migraine, the migraine with aura, also increase the risk a bit. The good thing is, there was never a better time to get migraine treatment. There are so many new drugs came out over the last years, and there are possibly so many more drugs coming out. So if you want migraine treatment, Elvis Presley was poor, he, there was nothing available, Botox was the first one, the monoclonal antibodies, the J pumps now. There are more and more drugs getting available for migraine patients. That's a good thing. And being quiet and not talking about it doesn't help. We have to, as men, we have to speak up and talk about migraine in men to make it acceptable for the society. Because it is, I know, and I would like to hear from you, possibly a lot of you, when you tell your doctor, uh, your, your employer, and say, I can't come to work because I have a headache, or you ring your employer, I can't come to work because I have a myocardial infarction. It's very, very different. Um, so these are something I would like to hear from you, really. And that's that's really it. Thank you so much, Thomas. That was absolutely brilliant. I learned a lot. I, I had no idea about Elvis, so I was um, stunned to hear that. Uh, we have had quite a few questions come in, and we've got just over 15 minutes. So again, apologies if we don't get through them all. We will try and get through as many as we can. But if not, do um, just look at our support services on our website. So without further ado, I will hand over to Oscar, and he will start to run through the questions. Thank you, Debs, and thanks, Thomas, as well. Yeah, some really great engagement in the comments. I uh, really enjoyed reading all of your feedback and your own experiences as well. So um, we'll go to a couple of questions then. So you mentioned quite early on, Thomas, about um, heart problems and medications. So a few people have, have brought this up and said, asked if you can talk a little bit more about this, and is there, um, should someone using medication, uh, migo medications, have their heart checked? Is there any you recommend that are safer for the heart? Yeah. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it depends on different, I just said in general heart problems, there are different kinds of heart problems. There's one heart problem, obviously, like you have a heart attack, like ischemic heart disease, and you have narrowing of blood vessels in the heart. There's some of the medications, for example, the sumatriptan, all the triptans can have the potential of giving you a heart attack when you're prone to this. So the, for that reason, triptans are actually not indi in, indicated on elderly patients. I can't remember the age now exactly, but on older patients, we don't give triptans for this reason or patients who have heart attacks or strokes in the past. But then you have also other heart problems. You might have an irregular heartbeat. You might have uh, you know, like a heart block or something like this. It's completely different to having a narrowed blood vessel. Then, for example, you can't take amitriptyline because that can affect it. And uh, then you maybe have other heart problem like a low blood pressure. There's a different heart problem again. Then you can't have to be careful with propanolol or with candesatin. So it depends a bit on your heart condition. And I know actually yesterday I was asked about a patient I wants to give the monoclonal antibodies, what you cannot give for ischemic heart disease, but this patient had an irregular heartbeat. So I went ahead and gave it to him. So it depends a bit. It's a bit tricky. You can't say, oh, you can't take this in heart problems. You should discuss this with your GP. And he has to make a decision if you need, for example, an ECG just, or if you need an echocardiogram of your heart, or maybe a treadmill test of your heart, uh, de depending on the medication. So you can't say heart problem is the same like heart problem. They're different kind of heart problem. And I think if you're concerned, you have to discuss it with your GP. Thank you, Thomas. Yeah, it's it so varies on person to person, doesn't it? So the next question we have is um, 
that we usually think of triptans as abortives as sort of rescue remedies but you mentioned about the sportsmen using them almost as a preventative prior to to preempt the migraine attack that may happen with exercise yeah so someone asked is this common um would would you recommend a longer acting triptan is this something that people can should should speak to their doctor about about taking it preemptively for if they know a trigger may yeah. cause a migraine attack so in general triptans are being used when you get the headache that is the idea that was the reason how triptans were invented but there are special situations where you take triptans as a preventer for example female patients take triptan as a preventer when they know they have menstrual migraine all around the migraine for four or five days around the period they take then in advance a triptan for five days just to prevent this. When you have exercise-induced headache, you can take a trip time before to try to, to uh, reduce the exercise, but you have to be careful because if you take it too often, it can give you medication over your headache. Some patients have coital headache, headache during intercourse. This can be a severe headache, a thunderclap headache, severe headache during intercourse, which comes on and on and on. It needs to be investigated, but if they have excluded a bleed or an aneurysm or something like this, and this comes on again, some patients take a triptan before intercourse to prevent this. So the normal route is to take triptan when you have the headache, but there are a few exceptions where you take a triptan as a preventer, but you have to be careful not to overuse it. Thank you, Thomas. That's fantastic. Yeah. Um, so someone, again, it was very interesting, you mentioned uh, about autism and the link to migraine, and someone wanted you to explore that a little bit more about sort of the links that there may be about neurodiversity and migraine. And I will say as well, we do actually have a blog ourselves coming out about the links between neurodiversity and migraine. So if you don't subscribe to our newsletter, you should. I do. But yeah, no, Thomas. Where, where, where I talked to, I'm not sure where I talked about. We do, I mentioned the epilim, the sodium valparate, and there was felt it might cause autism. I don't know where I talked about autism and migraine, but we do know that migraine is more associated with autism, yes. And uh, we yeah, made, I think that's we, what they meant. Yeah. yeah. So, but we we would treat it more aggressively because obviously we in general look. I believe a lot in lifestyle change. I of course I give all these medications, but as I mentioned earlier, on, we have a psychologist working our service. We have physiotherapists, so we believe a lot in lifestyle change. And a lot of lifestyle you can change. Now autism you can't. So for that reason, I would have a lower threshold of giving medications in autism. So. This is not something, but it's my opinion. I don't have any studies about this, but sometimes the migraine brain is a bit like the autistic brain. When you have a migraine, you're getting overwhelmed with stimuli, light, loud noises, smell. You go to bed to take yourself away. You darken the room to be in a dark, quiet room to take away yourself from all the stimuli. And then because they trigger the migraine. And that's similar to autism. When patients are overstimulated with stimuli, they have a headphone or something to take to reduce all this. So the brain, that is something I always explain patients, uh, but I have no study or something to, you know, to, to confirm this. But sometimes it reminds me, migraine brain, a bit of an autistic brain, while you have the migraine, because you're not able to deal with too many stimuli at the same time. Um, so I would treat autistic patients possibly a bit more aggressive when they have migraine. Thank you. Yeah, it's interesting to talk about that holistic approach and taking on and yeah, any other things affecting people. Um, so someone said, as a man over 40 years of age and overweight, I understand that triptans have serious potential side effects. Is there one which is safer as an option than others for someone in that experience? No, the triptans are kind of, well, I use a lot of sumatriptan. I would think most consultants use sumatriptan. There are different reasons. Obviously, they all exist in tablet form. Some of them also come in nasal spray, like the sumatriptan, and some of them come as injections as well as the sumatriptan, so it's easier to escalate it. But the main difference between the triptans is uh, how long it takes for them to work. Some are faster acting, some are more slow acting. So when I told you early on that a female patient takes triptan around the period, you want to have a slow acting triptan, which is, for example, forvatriptan. Um, I wouldn't give sumatriptan then around the period. I would give more longer acting triptan. But I wouldn't say that one, or let's say that I'm not aware that one is safer in ischemic heart disease than another one. Now, the thing is, if somebody failed on two triptans, you would qualify to take if the J-pumps. I haven't told or talked about the J-pumps. The J-pumps is a new drug which came out now. I don't know if it's ever available. And this was an alternative to the triptans. And this 
should be safe in ischemic heart disease. And the good thing is j punks don't have the risk of giving you a medication over your headache. So this seems to be a new drug. Now to get access to it, you need to have failed on two triptans at the moment. But some patients that are, have contraindications. So you might give it even without having failed on a triptan. You've uh, beautifully segued into my next question there, Thomas. Someone did bring up blue pants and actually asked any known potential side effects of, of the blue pants, anything that people should look out for, be concerned about. You see, I I don't have too many patients on it. I, was, I would guess I have maybe 30 patients on it. Not a lot. It's a new drug. Now, with the Ogimetra pants, uh, it is that you it is licensed for episodic migraine, so a headache less than 15 days per month, you can use as a preventer, and you take 75 milligrams every other day, or you take it for acute episodes for episodic or chronic migraine. Now, side effects, to be honest, I'm not aware of major side effects. It might be constipation or something like this. I don't think it affects the heart, so we are pretty, I think they're pretty safe, really. So I'm not aware of any major side effects. I definitely haven't seen any patient of mine who had any side effect on them. Right, it's an exciting time to yeah be thinking about these new medications. Uh, probably have time for one or two more questions. So we had um, people having a bit of a discussion about triggers in the chat, which is always really interesting to see. So obviously some track triggers you can sort of easily correct, dehydration, food, but there are a few discussions about some of the harder triggers like weather. So someone um, finds it really difficult to deal with weather, that's a trigger for them. And they were asking for your advice if, if you have triggers like that that are less you can control what, what sort of the best way to deal with them would be. So the first thing is to identify the trigger. And as I told you early on, you have to look when you have a bad day, look back, what have you done? And I give you an example. For example, I had a patient, I gave a headache diary. He was in the 70s and he said, I got the headache. He couldn't identify any trigger. I gave him a headache diary to write down the headache. And then you realize the headache diary, that's funny. I always get the headache on Sunday at one o'clock. I was never aware of that. And then he thought back 24 hours, what did he do? And then you realize, well, every Sunday morning, I buy a newspaper. All other days, I read the news on my mobile phone, but Sunday, I have a nice breakfast and buy the newspaper. And then you realize that the smell of the newspapers was triggering his headache. So he doesn't buy a newspaper anymore, and his headache is gone. So think about trigger. The first thing is to identify it. And then you have to try, can you avoid it or can't you avoid it? So obviously, a different kind of triggers. Light can be triggers. Simon Cowell bought, bought the glasses. Loud noises can be trigger. Uh, some jobs you maybe can, some patients prefer to work from home more. So some people prefer to work uh, from home, some more from the office, some have more combination, but I do know the open offices quite often, there are loud noises, there's light, there's a lot of things going on. A lot of people with migraine prefer to sit at home on their own computer and work from home. So you have to identify the trigger some triggers like weather, well, you can't change the weather, unfortunately. I don't know. But I do know that a lot of patients who have weather-induced migraine or headache are getting misdiagnosed of having sinusitis because they quite often having fulling of the sinuses and they're getting antibiotic after antibiotic. And in fact, they have a migraine brought on by weather. So you have to identify the trigger and then you have to see, can I do something about it? Exercise is the biggest trigger. It's a big trigger in men on female patient uh, Hormone, obviously, big, biggest trigger. You have really tackle the hormones. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Probably have time to squeeze one more question in. So we know with, with women that age and time and kind of progression can be a big trigger. So we know around sort of menopause and around sort of um, puberty, they may see sort of increases and then at other times they may see decreases. Is there anything sort of a similar pattern we see in men around um, someone mentioned sort of uh, andropause and decreases in, in testosterone? Do we notice when it's more prevalent in men of a certain age and not, or does it seem to really vary? I see, as I told you, there's a new talk for me. <laughs> and I thought yeah. it had to figure out with men and women. Obviously, female patients, we know the change of the estrogen. We know the menopause. Quite often, women getting better during menopause. Some don't. We do know when you have mechanical menopause, when you have the hysterectomy done, the ovaries removed, the headache is probably getting, getting quite often worse uh, than if you have a natural menopause. It's very, very complicated. Quite often, you tell women that, and then they tell you, but in my case, it's different. So every patient is different. With male patients, I do not know what the testosterone is doing. The hormones in female is not the high or low hormone, it's more the fluctuation of the hormone. And the testosterone doesn't fluctuate so much. 
So I can tell you have one man who has a headache and this came on when he was 20 years on and at his first day at work and it stopped when he was 65 on his last day at work. Uh, so it might be more stress or work related. I don't know. Hormonal wise in men, I would not know, but it's definitely something I will read up because I suppose there's possibly more behind it than we know at the moment.